It's High Noon with David. He's gone and fallen in love with Jesus and bringing boldness to the body of Christ. Here's David. Welcome to High Noon with David. This is show number 234. Or is it? Yeah. <laughs> Number 234. Here to bring you a gift. Gift of boldness. Boldness to do what? Boldness to believe in spite of all the doubt and unbelief that's around. And all the dead religious tradition that's around. (laughs) To believe in spite of all that. To believe more in what you don't see. Than believing in what you do see. Uh, You've heard many a time, many people have about doubting Thomas. He said, I won't, they they came back and said, we've seen Jesus, he's alive. After he'd been hung on a cross and died and put in a tomb, he didn't believe it. He said, I'll only believe it if I see it. Put my hand in his side and touch the nail prints in his hands and here comes Jesus walking through the wall. I love it. And he said, Thomas, put your hand in my side. Thomas, feel the print in my hands. He said, my Lord, my God. Jesus said, yeah, you believe because you've seen. But more blessed are those who have not seen and yet they believe anyway. I'm telling you, Jesus died for you was raised from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for you. That you'll listen to this crazy Yahoo out here in the bushes with a fire going to keep him warm. I'm out here with my flip-flops and my shorts on and and it's pretty nippy. It was 11 degrees just a few days ago and now, you know, we're sitting about 51, 52 degrees. But it's still chilly. But it's better than 11 by far. But I'm here to invade your home your car, your deer stand, uh, wherever it is you're listening to me, on your computer, whatever part of the world. We got people around the world uh, listening on the Internet. And here in, we're on TV here in central Mississippi, about 40 counties. They, they said it wasn't but 24 counties, but they've been calling from further than that. So I think these antennas got a little extra power, these power antennas they're using. I'm here to, here to tell you something. Believe more in what you don't see than what you see with your eyes. Because that tree right there, right behind me, was created out of the unseen. Yeah. Now I want to read to you. I'm going to flip over to the back. I'm talking about the miracles. And I got to preaching this last week and I didn't even really get to share much because... Uh, about Peter's mother-in-law getting healed. That's the one we own right now. We're going to walk through all 16 of them that are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And uh, this one is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I want, to, I want to read to you out of 1 John 4, verse 17. It says, God is love. Woo! What a revelation. Those who are living in love are living in God. This Passion Translation. My favorite one. People say, well, that's just that guy's take on it. No. I, I, I got this one guy that can can uh, read Arabic. Aramaic, Aramaic, whatever you call it. Hebrew and Greek. Without a dictionary, he says this will be the most read translation within the next year, within the next 12 months. I absolutely love it. Now, religious people, they threw it away. They took it out where I had all my Bible apps on there for free. You know, it was like 20, 30-something of them. They took this one off. And like, yeah, mm mm-hmm. I understand why your stupid tradition has messed you up on it. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God. And God lives through them. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment 
I ain't afraid of God. Now the, now the word says fear God, but it means to respect and have reverence for him. It's better said that you respect him and have reverence. People say all the time, well, I fear God. No, you don't. You sleep through. You watch TV all the time. It's all you self-absorbed, self-inflated. You don't have a prayer life. If you respect God, you'll have a prayer life. Not out of works. It's, this is a free gift of God. Salvation is free as it can be. But you know how you get to know Jesus? By being around Him. People say, well, I know God. Well, all right. All I got to do is ask them about three or four questions, and I know they don't. Are you righteous? Are you a saint? Can God do anything He wants to? Oh, yeah. Is God in control? Oh, yeah. And I said, you wrong on all four counts. Or either you need to get born again. Well, I, well I'm going to heaven. Well, you'll never be any more righteous than the moment you receive by grace through faith what Jesus did for you. Not even when you get to heaven, you'll not be any more righteous. Well, how do you know that? I meditate in the Word. And you interpret the Word by the Word, not by some idiot's opinion that's been to a cemetery and got a Ph.D. I got a Ph.D. in post-hole digging and piled high and dry when we're, when we're stacking hay. Boy, when I was a lad, we hauled a lot of hay. And I was so dumb when I started, they put me up in the barn where it was the hottest. And, and finally I caught on and I said, uh-uh, your turn, boy. <laughs> so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. Because all that Jesus now is, so is David E. Dixon in the earth. That's what my Bible says. That's what your Bible says if you meditate in it and see it. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. Anyone can say, I love God, yet have hatred toward another believer. This makes him a phony because if you don't love a brother or a sister whom you can see, how can you truly love God whom you can't see? For he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also demonstrate love to others. And see... The love thing, if you just simply get to know him, is an easy thing. Oh, look, I've I've done all the stuff. I chased women when I was a teenager. Good Lord, me and Jerry, Jerry don't come to my meeting because he knows I may say something about him, but he's my dear friend. We're still close, close friends today. And, uh, but Jerry, Jerry and I do four counties We'd leave Pickens, the Holmes County, and then we'd end up in Yazoo County. We'd end up in Madison County, and then we'd end up in Hines County sometimes, on just on one Saturday night. And and normally, I didn't just go out and drink socially. I got so drunk, somebody had to throw my little skinny butt over the over the shoulder and take me home. And, uh, you know, just, I was in church every time the doors was open. But I was like, what the hell? We, Dad is a deacon. Mama teaches Sunday school. We have cussing fits every night at our house. I had to go get Daddy out of jail four times when I was 14 years old. Of course, I held it over his head, and I got to use the car on Friday nights when I was 14 years old. I got to go dating. <laughs> of course, I, back then, you could get a permit at 14, or a hardship permit or whatever. I forget what it was back then. And uh, but I was like, what the hell? We're in church every time the doors open and we live in hell at our house. But I found out something. My crazy mama got around Callan and Bird and Johnny. And they, they started speaking in unknown tongues. And uh, I watched it change them. I watched the supernatural change them 
they were ridiculed by the Baptists, by the Methodists, by the Presbyterians, by the Catholics, by all kind of folks. But I watched them, and they wasn't getting any success. And I watched Carolyn and Johnny and Mama and Bird, and there was others. There was Ann. There was another Carolyn. There was some others. But mainly the ones I saw were Johnny and Mama and Carolyn. And Bird, every now and then she lived out, out of town. But I watched them. Spent time every day in prayer. And they did not allow those full of doubt and unbelief talk them out of it. They did not turn cowardly from prayer. Oh, it changed me. There came a day I said, okay, Jesus, you either real or you ain't. And I found out that it was because when I started yielding, I ask people, are you a saint? They go, oh, no, I am a saint. The moment you get born again, you're a saint. They got some of the big shots with this religious organization. They wait till after they've died before they call them a saint. Well, I beat that sucker. I got, I became a saint the moment I got born again. Can God do anything He wants? No, He cannot. Oh, yeah, He can. No, He cannot. He cannot lie. If He does, we're screwed. <laughs> He can't go against His Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of things He can't do. People think, in, in, in most denominations and in, in, in religious organizations believe God's putting cancer on people to teach them something. I ain't never seen one time where Jesus laid hands on somebody and said, receive cancer, I need to teach you how to live right. Ain't no, and now he, they can turn you over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh that your soul may be saved. Spirit. I don't understand that part of it. But they don't do it. G, G, Jesus, the word says, by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. It says he carried, put on him all your transgressions and carried away all your diseases. That's Jesus. Well, I don't believe that. We'll go watch Bugs Bunny. You and, and die, and then come back and tell me I'm wrong. There's some things I have learned. I've learned that a lot that I've been wrong on. At least I'll admit it. <laughs> Boy, this is good teaching. It's really, really good. I, I really enjoy editing my show before I send it to the TV station because. This thing just come to me while I'm standing out here by myself talking to this camera. Talking to you. There ain't no audience. There ain't no sanctuary full of people. It's just me out here in the bushes with my geese and the squirrels and the raccoons and the deer and everything else. <laughs> oh, boy. Thank you, Jesus. I'm having so much fun. Man, the last two or three days I had me. I, I ain't had me a bacon and tomato and mayonnaise sandwich and a long, long time. I, I just got me some tomatoes and some bacon. and I had sam bacon and tomato sandwiches three days in a row. And I'm thinking about having me another one in just a little while. I start so early in the morning with prayer. I, my first alarm goes off at 3.38. And most of the time I'm awake before that. My second one goes off at uh, 4 o'clock. The third one goes off at 4.10. That was my first shotgun. And then the next one goes off at 427. That was my favorite engine back in the day. You know, people say, what you got in that thing? Boy, you got a 427 in that thing? We, we used to race back in the day. Don't don't ever do that. But uh, we just did a lot of things. You know, when you're from a little town, you think up stuff. You get real creative stuff to do. And then my last alarm goes off at 430 in the morning. That's, but I'm actually on four, prayer by 427. And Jan Barnes out of Grenada, 79 years old, she beats me every morning. She's my prayer partner. And then we have people come on at 4.30. We got Soul Winner out of Oklahoma, Mississippi. He's like, he, he gets people healed and saved. He's a fantastic Soul Winner. And then David Chandler comes on with us at 4.30. And then we have others come on. And then Dalton comes on four five o'clock. And then other ones start coming in there at 5.02. And then we, and we probably, out of all the people we pray 
in the mornings, and that's every morning of the week. Been doing it for many, 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 many years. So it's been 17, 18 years since we started when David's kids were kidnapped. And then we prayed 11.30 Monday through Friday till 1 o'clock. Now, don't just let anybody come on and pray with us. If you're an idiot, you know, I mean, I check. You have to have an interview with me before I let you start praying with us because we don't allow, we don't do a bunch of junk and doubt and unbelief and, oh, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, hey, we'll mourn with you and we'll cry with you. But we pray in faith. Prayer has to be mixed with faith or it's a wasted effort. If we weren't getting results, I wouldn't dare do it. And then I get on with my pastor and his wild and woolly bunch. A lot of times at 6 o'clock in the evening, we go two hours. And a lot of days we pray four and a half. Personally, I pray four and a half, five hours a lot of days. And But I started out setting a goal, I'm going to pray ten minutes. I tell people, look at your watch and set your timer for seven minutes. And when you pray in tongues, you get built up. It's like drinking a seven up. Pray seven minutes and get built up. Then add a minute every day to your prayer life. I've had people I've worked with, got them praying. They're so excited, change their life. And then they listen, some idiot comes along. One of Job's comforters comes along and talks to them. So you don't need to be doing that. You need to get away from that idiot. You need me to get away from that guy. Oh, disappointing as it can be. But I tell you what, I just go, next. My heart's to get people praying, winning people to Jesus, soul winning. Casting out demons, laying hands on the sick and healing them. Praise God. I won't go away. I've irritated a lot of preachers over the years. And, and, uh, and I feel for them. I know, I, I know I've, I've, I've caused trouble just by, actually I've caused trouble by praying more than usual and being in the Word more than usual. So I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to speak up. And I'm going to be very bold about it. If you're a chicken about Especially if you've prayed in tongues in the past and your church is just, you've watered it down. There's no anointing there. I've had people, I have no precious friends of mine. People have come to me, well, they quit, wouldn't, won't allow it on Sunday morning. But they don't have the anointing anytime anymore. But it's, but it's, but it's shiny. Oh, they, they got a bigger crowd now. They finally got enough money for the mortgage every month and the pastor's got a good salary now. If that's all there is to it, to hell with it. People need to be getting healed. People need to be getting born again. People think people's lives need to be changed. People need to be discipled in the local church. They go out in the streets, in the, in the workplace, and turn it, turn it upside down. You know, the word says, Them that have turned the world upside down have come amongst us also. And here we come. <laughs> I shared in last week's show, which I just filmed a little bit. If I do two shows at a time, this morning during prayer, man, we just got to praying in tongues. And then we got to calling out about the living waters, and there's a river flowing out of me. And man, that song, I got a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk. And the blind to see, man. We just got to sing it. We we about to float, float out of this earth suit, man. That's who we are. Demas Shakarian, I got to meet him in a restaurant one day. He was there by himself, and I walked up and talked to him, told him how much I loved him, appreciated him. He was president of the Fellowship of uh, Business. He was, he was president of the uh, Full Gospel Businessmen's Association, or, or whatever they call it, and uh, used tremendously. He wrote a book entitled The Happiest People on Earth. You know, it's amazing the devil is, has, in, in denominations and religious organizations have mocked and ridiculed speaking in tongues. It ain't about you being an idiot and running around here looking like an idiot. It edifies you when you pray in unknown tongues. And if you're letting people around you stop you, and if you're going to a dead church that don't do it, get out of your damn dead church. Quit acting like a little sissy baby. Grow your backbone. God ain't requiring you to stay there. Grow a backbone. Do whatever you, if you have to go start a new church, go start one. Start. But don't you don't sit there and listen to that doubt and unbelief. Grow a backbone and help people. You, you, I've got friends that gone to dead churches and just, well, you got to go somewhere. And, and they blended in and it changed them. 
They're no longer alive like they were. Oh, they're alive, but they're not lively like they used to be in the Word and in prayer. So, boy, I'm running out of time. As he is, so are you in the earth as a believer. Say this after me. Say, Jesus is Lord. Say, I choose to believe. Jesus, you died for me. And God, you raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible says if you do that, you're saved. You don't need to walk down the aisle of a church. Well, I ain't against that. I think, I think you ought to have an altar call every service your church has. And have somebody spiritual enough down there to talk to them, take them in the back and give them some material to read that will help them grow. Get the name and the number and call them and go by and pick them up and go get a fish sandwich, take them fishing, take them deer hunting, take them somewhere, hang out with them and help grow them up. Be around them. Disciple them. Grow them up. Rarely done thing. Well, if you just you just be at church during the magic hour. I know plenty of people have been to church during the magic hour and they're about as spiritual, a dirt clod more spiritual than they are. Daily, 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 daily getting to know Jesus. Listen, I still fart. I still scratch my butt and I still pick my nose and thank God I got healed of eating boogers. I think, what, been about three weeks ago now. <laughs> Listen, I'm rescued. I still live in a flesh body. My body wants to have sex. My body wants to eat way too much ice cream. You know, I jokingly say that, uh, boy, I love fried chicken. Whew. Now I backed off some. Now I had, I have to, I had to stay in shape with these grandkids, man. They keep me rock and roll. We had a, they had a mud bath. They, they got so covered in mud day four. Yes, actually, it's Sunday afternoon. I got pictures of them. They had more fun getting mud in that mud. Oh, my goodness gracious. I had more fun than all the toys in the store down here. Say this after me. Say, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Say that again. Say, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen. Say, Jesus is Lord. Say, I choose to believe. You died for me. And God, you raised Jesus from the dead. Say, I've got a river of life. Just sing that. If you, if you by yourself, you, you can do it later on when you, if you need to get away from somebody. Say, i got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk. Can the blind to see? I got a river of life flowing out of me. Oh, I got a river of life flowing out of me. <laughs> Love you. I'll be right back in just a minute. Back again. You know, I was with this guy that they got his first book. I've helped a lot of people get their first book over the years. And he just was the F word every other breath and just blow. You know, I ain't said one word to him because down on the inside, the Lord taught me many years ago. He said, David, I want you to see him through my eyes. And I want you to see him hurt no more. The Lord gave me a song years ago. So I see them through the eyes of Jesus. I see them hurting no more. So I see this guy, a lot of hurt in his life. But I just looked, I, I, I looked past the cussing, the F word, every other breath. I, I looked past the thing, and I see him the way Father sees him. See, the devil go, wants to accuse you of all this crap. And, and the devil went to, to God and accused Job of some things. Well, now, because of the blood of Jesus, when the devil accuses you of stuff to God, God looks at you, but he looks at you through the blood of Jesus, and he sees you hurting no more. So that's the way I've learned to look at people. Now, I don't always get it. I mean, sometimes I want to knock somebody upside the head just like everybody else wants to. But I saw the Lord doing something. He set this guy up, man. And a friend of mine, he said, he said, I just feel like he's supposed to come on this trip with my son. And it's their first cousin. And I was like, okay. And I didn't preach at him. I didn't go quoting scripture at him, but... Helped him get his deer and talk to him and let him share his hurts to me and stuff. And we're out there in the woods and the cold and perfect weather and everything. And 
Bah, he got his deer. He did just wrote exactly how I told him to do it. And went and helped him get the deer. And I actually cut the debone, the whole thing. And skinned it out where he can have a nice shoulder mount at the taxidermist. You know, I skinned it from, from all the way from that, almost to the hind quarter. So it had plenty of cake for his mount. And But there was a time before he left that I opened up and shared some things with him. And, and the Lord touched that guy big time. But if you think that somebody's got to quit cussing and doing all that before they can get born again, that ain't right. The Word says in Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10 that if you will say with your mouth, what is it? What say it that the Word is near you even in your mouth and in your heart? He didn't say confess your sin either. Now for the believer, there's the Word says in the book of James. Hey, I want to throw this little episode in on how to partner and help this ministry out. The word partner is one who takes part with another to do something. And I know a bunch of you want to take part with me to help me do something. What are we doing? We're doing discipling and evangelism. We're doing discipling especially through prayer. 4.30 every morning of the week till for about an hour to an hour and a half. Monday through Friday, 11.30 to 1 p.m., we have, we have a bunch of folks praying daily. And the best way to disciple is somebody is through prayer and teaching of the Word and equipping. And another thing we're doing is evangel- evangelizing, just like through this show, and we're reaching people one-on-one and through meetings. And there's a lot of fruit, and we're having a whole lot of fun. I want to read you a scripture. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind. This is a scripture. What you will give. That will protect you against sob stories. I just don't know we're going to make it if you don't help us. I'm in my 42nd year. And uh, I ain't had to beg and I ain't had to sob for your money. This will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. Tell you a real quick story about a young man that came to us, started praying with us. He was scared to get a job because he'd get around the crew again and get back on drugs. He temporarily went back on drugs, came off, and he will tell you the thing that has helped him more than anything else. He prays with us daily. He became a youth pastor. The, the, the great fruit and he's been off of drugs and he'll tell you the best thing that ever helped him was daily prayer daily in the word with us and in growing with a group that loves him so that's just one of the stories some of the fruit there's many more and we'll share others thank you for helping i know you want to it's high noon with david He's gone and fallen in love with Jesus and bringing boldness to the body of Christ. Here's David.